So, Matt, I just want to say thank you for being able to get on this interview. I got to hit up all the other guys to get them on this. And um, just so you get a little bit of another recap of what we'll talk about, we'll talk about current issues going on in the world, like the civil rights movement that we have going on. We'll talk about your health and wellness journey and more so from the perspective as a new coach and then life-changing moments and a couple of gems to share to the next generation. So no that being said, how are you doing with everything going on and how are you navigating your emotions, your feelings, and what you're trying to do with uh, what is happening within America and the world? Yeah, that's a, that's a loaded question. So get ready. Um, so one, I will like to say that I probably work for the best bosses in the business right now. Um, because when this all popped off, they immediately like called, text me and like had a conversation with me about it. Um, and that's, I mean, not cause I'm like one of two people on one of two pe black people on staff, but like they were genuinely questioning about it. And it's good to have that support from the people that you work with. Um, and they told me straight up, they were like, we want you to talk to the athletes and have these hard conversations. Um, because uh, the affluent area that we're in, there's not a lot of us um, in the area that come into the gym, that their parents train here and whatnot. So um, it's definitely eye-opening for them. Um, and I've had all the real conversations. I told them how I got a gun pulled out on me in Tenafly. Um, I was actually just telling Jacob this morning, uh, last night, I live in Bogota, and uh, you're right by me. I'm, I'm in New Milford. Oh, you're in New Milford. Oh, so you're gonna love this one. So last night, I'm taking my garbage out to put out for the morning, and um, there's a traffic light like three houses down, and a white truck uh, pulls around the corner, two flags on the back of it, and a noose hanging out the fucking uh, back of the uh, bed. Um, so I'm pulling my trash out and like my, well, how my driveway is, is that I'm on a hill, like my driveway is on a hill. So I got to roll the trash can all the way to the hill, down the hill to bring it to the grass. And they saw me and one screamed like, oh, look, it's a fucking nigger. And I like couldn't process to like look at the license plate at that moment. I was like, did that really just happen in Bogota, New Jersey of all places? Um, Isn't Bogota like high with Latinos? And thank Latinos? you. Am yeah, I? Thank I'm not bugging, right? No, you're not bugging, right? Yeah. So to see that, like, and that's the first time in Bergen County that it's ever been that blatant to me. I mean, I grew, I, I went to Bergenfield High School, um, went to West Point, and then I'm back in the business now. But that was the first time that has ever blatantly happened to me. I've been pulled over for DWB, driving while black, antenna fly. Um, but not as like blatant shit like that. That's like the first time that ever happened. So, um, and from that perspective, well, I want to comment on a couple of things from the perspective of just what you said about Joe, Dan, Mike, and all them. They've always been upstanding guys where they show up and they're really about the community. So for them to yeah. be so proactive, I'm not even shocked. That's just that's in their in their spirit and. I'm glad that they're allowing you to take the helm on this because like they said, you know, they, they're asking questions because they won't ever understand or be able to put themselves in your shoes. So, right. You know that, and I'm glad that you're able to be the one talking to the kids about what's going on, especially if it's a Latino kid, black kid, and they may not know how to maneuver, especially when, when you're in that affluent area where they make, they're going to be the minority and not in a bad way where it's just, that's just what the number looks like. Yeah. You know? That that's just racism to its definition. I I'm literally shocked that that happened in Bogota. I'm just shocked in general that we we can't just move past the the fact that we're literally all spirits and physical bodies. Don't even get me started. That's a whole dissertation that I got for later. <laughs> that's a whole dissertation. But to answer the second part of what you said though, is right now since jersey is open we've been able to do offsite training with our athletes and whatnot and offsite training with the adults and i legitimately i work like 12 hour days but i do it to myself because being in the gym being around the adults being around the athletes is like my mental space 
um, and lifting, obviously. Um, when things open back up, I intend on competing for Olympic lifting. So um, right. those are the two things that mentally that has helped a lot. And then once I like, I don't bury myself in work where it's like all work, work, work. Like when I go home, I like decompress and relax. But I tell my athletes, like I, I said this, uh, I said this in my post that I had yesterday is like, tell your athletes you love them. Um, Cause you never know whose uh, life you're going to change by saying that. And I tell them that damn near every day, um, more times than not, I'll break down on family with my athletes. Um, because during the uncertain time right now, that's all you have to rely on is family. Um, and I treat them that way. So that is to answer that question as to how I'm navigating with that mentally, physically, spiritually, and all that is really like, one, I'm in a great business that I work for. And two, along with the great businesses, the great people that I uh, serve as well. That's beautiful. And the biggest thing there is that the way in which you're moving is about, <laughs> you need that open. <laughs> I would have been so mad if I got coffee on this white shirt. Uh, I mean, there's definitely a couple more shirts. I've seen the inventory. Yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> why, why are you screaming? My bad. <laughs> so with the, the family part, it's, it's about coexisting. And when you show up with how you were brought up and how you were raised, now, when you're telling people that you love them, they're seeing it from so many different perspectives and aspects, you know, with us being in the field of, at the end of the day, we're providing a service, we're up service as strength coaches. And when we show up and we're either giving advice or we're helping them set up weights or whatever the case may be, or just talking and hearing them out, that is a form of unconditional love. Those are many forms of it. So that's, that's powerful. Yeah. So, all right, cool. Now with that, I want to transition over with, talking about the health and fitness world now with with you i get to t with some people that i've been interviewing is more so how they are doing in, in their in their own health and wellness journey i want to ask you where do you see the health and wellness industry going with these uh, new changes and what have you been seeing yo lifetime going out of business 24 hour going out of business gold's gym going out of business all them motherfuckers <laughs> going out of business all of them all of them Bad. um I'm going I'm to put that, you could quote me on that, you could tag me on that, all them <laughs> motherfuckers going bankrupt, out of business. <laughs> I'm going to stay with that shit now. And I have no problem attaching my name to it. Um, sorry. That was, talk. I just got really fired up. Live your life, live your life. Live, live, live. <laughs> that, no, want. That, I truly believe from a business perspective, that is where the industry is going right now. The big box gyms, um, where, with lifetime, 24 an hour and all that, like it's going to take too long for people to be comfortable to going back to what things used to be. They're going to want to be in more small group session training, right? Now, can they change their model of how they rearrange the gym? Yes. But and does that potentially open more jobs for qualified uh, personal trainers and whatnot? Yes. However, that will take them too long. And one of the things that we just talked about is that we have rapport with our clients, right? So like we have personal relationships with most of our clients here that like it's really hard for them to say no to us, right? There's no emotional attachment to any one person or one or one body when it goes when it comes to those big commercial gyms. And that's where I truly see the industry is going to shift after COVID is that you're going to see places like overtime athlete, like rain phone training, like varsity house gym. We're going to probably get more business on the, on that end where like retro is going to start slacking a little bit. Lifetime is going to start hurting a little bit. And that's going to matriculate to the point where like those gyms are going to have to close down. I don't foresee the 24 hour in Paramus is going to last very long. Honestly, the 24 hour in Paramus, right now what I'm seeing is consolidation. They're just trying to consolidate so that they don't go bankrupt. Regardless of what happens, I see another whole wave of coronavirus hitting us. Oh, absolutely. Off the rip. So there, that's when it's just like, yo, guys, we can't do anything. They're just trying to look good 
on the news, but they're not making it. And you said a good point. The big thing too, that I'm seeing twofold occupancy, you can't have too many people within a, a building, no matter what the square footage is, the square fo- footage. Um, and then the caliber of the trainer, most of these places, if they end up downsizing to a boutique gyms, they're still going to have that corporate feel, but yeah. how extensive and how great are their, um, their, their curriculums? Like, yeah. I tell you from being able to go to RPP learning at, at varsity house and at Equinox as well. I went through the curriculum. Equinox has a great scientific curriculum, can knock them. Nonetheless, the hands-on experience that I had at RPP and the way in which I got to just navigate and, man- and maneuver, move through BOS from Varsity House, as well as just being around the guys and with me and Adam pretty much growing up through college, there's going to be so many different elements that I've that you can't learn at a box gym compared right. to these private gyms just because of how the people run it and it's more genuine you're getting that family type of vibe so i'm right there with you it's definitely going to be interesting to see how fast they decline equinox i don't see them going too far away just because they are owned by a real estate company called related and yeah owns that owns the dolphins Stephen ross they may they may last a little bit longer they got big bucks big yeah. big 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 pockets but Regardless, it is definitely going down the semi-private boutique type of space. Now, that's from the adult perspective. In terms of athletes, right, I literally just put this out on my Twitter this morning, and I had ruffled a lot of feathers. My Friday morning thought was that AAU ruins athletic development. Yeah, it's too competitive. And I've been going on a tangent after listening to, shit, I could go through a list of the big wigs that I've talked to, listened to. I mean, I just had a call on Wednesday with Aaron Osmus, double A. Um, I've talked to Brian Hess, who's the head strength coach at UNC. Most of these guys were my old strength coaches throughout college. So they said that the biggest hindrance that they see is their one sport athletes, right? Even the two sport athlete is more uh, useful and available than the one sport athletes. And I, I can't remember who said it. I don't know if it was Brian Mann or so. I was listening to a podcast and one of them said, AU is the reason that athletics is in the shambles that it's in today. Volleyball, basketball, and soccer are the three sports that you can play all year round. Now explain to me why is a, a, a freshman in high school playing damn near a a NBA schedule of 82 games on the year, plus or minus 10. Not taking recovery, not allowing their work capacity to develop, not allowing their skill sets to be broadened, especially as a freshman where they could be playing several sports. It doesn't make any sense because the wider the foundation and the bases, the higher the pyramid can go. Right. It's... A form it's business and they're just exploiting the fact that parents are going to want to have their kids play against competitive kids but why the hell am i going to be competing the whole year round i should be training to then compete. right so i had i just i literally was just having this conversation with jacob before you came, before i got on this call with you was that he said um one person brought one person that tweeted against me brought up they were like uh how are you, don't you agree that AAU helps your skill set? And I said, yes, to a certain extent though. And I basically explained, so like I was a three sport athlete in high school. I was football, basketball, and track. And all the sports intertwined with each other that helped the other sport better. So like me being a football player, I was an outside linebacker, but like I was pretty good in dealing with space and my spatial awareness was a little bit better because of me playing basketball. And my explosiveness coming off a break and whatnot was a lot faster because of my time in track. Basketball, I was obviously a little bit more aggressive and a little bit better on a first step because of track and football. Track is just track, right? I was a jumper and a, and a sprinter, which I was working on my, on my power and my explosiveness to help me for the other two sports. But what kids don't understand these days is that the sports intertwine with each other to help you And where I do agree with Jacob on one point is that like at some point in high school, you have to start figuring out what you want 
as I do agree with that, I don't think you need to sacrifice a sport to, to, to hone in on what sport you're going to go in. Right. So like, if you're going to be, if you want to get recruited for football or whatnot, yo, all the power to you, but I don't think you need to cut off. Like, I don't think you need to cut off. Like if I finish my senior year of football and say, no, nah, I'm not going to do basketball my senior year, but I'm going to do senior year track, take that, take that winter off. I don't think so. Think about it like this. Now the coach sees you just stop basketball and he's just like, why is he giving up on the team? He's played all the other years. Cause that, that was another really thing I was going to say. Really kill him. Like, wait, he's going to give up to just be good for football, but now he's giving up on his team. What if he gives up on our team? Right. And then another thing too, is like, people will talk about the load tonnage and all that, but like, it's people would say like, it's probably not ideal to go from football to basketball argument against that is that it's probably not is you look at it so we had we had a two sport athlete um who was a football player um and he did indoor and outdoor track and also trained in the gym right so like even if you take away one sport in the winter they're still going to be training and by week seven they're still going to be pulling pushing pressing a whole bunch of weight so the load like yeah a coach can manage the load a little bit but like the to me the load the load is gonna essentially add up in training over a thirteen week block as it is during a whole basketball season. Hundred percent. And if there was more communication with the coaches, the, the biggest thing that I see in every space that I'm in is that there's a lot of dots and people need to start connecting the dots uh, at mm -hmm. the time or lack of automation. But once the coach is talking to the trainers, the trainers are able to max uh, man maneuver with the volume and load of stress and tension on the body. And let's say, you know, now your, your football player, he's about to go get ready for basketball. You can focus on loosening up his hips that he's been in, in a low position for a long time. You could get him ready for that transition. So it really comes down to what I know Adam does a good job at is connecting dots, talking to trainers, talking to doctors, talking to coaches and um, being able to say, all right, now that we know we're keeping this athlete fit and strong and maintaining, some are still able to increase and get stronger, which is phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's make sure that we, we can undulate the, the volume while they're transitioning sports and they need different skill sets to be at a higher percentage and level than others. Exactly. Exactly. And then this is just my college tangent is that um, the industry needs to phase out the old meathead milk crate generation of strength coaches who literally pride themselves off uh, Charlie Francis's readings and whatnot, and don't continue their education because they're not helping their athletes. I mean, the best ability is availability. I mean, I've heard that more times than not in the field. And yet, we still think that having an athlete box squatting 505 um or 90 percent of their one rep max for two reps for a 10 by two and doing the next week 95 percent is getting them stronger mentally tough and all that yet they can barely do a single leg bulgarian split squat and brace their abs and hold the position um be able to that's just the in the college realm of things the meathead milk crate generation needs to start phasing out um and where the younger now i'm not saying that their ex experience is invaluable that's not what i'm saying but those guys need to just those guys need to be in the books and learning from other people just as much as we are and i start i started to see this in my experiences that like college coaches look down upon private sector coaches and i still can't understand why that's um, I'm I still trying to figure it out, but they I just logo accreditation, I guess. But I don't know what it is. The ones I talk to don't don't look at that with me. They help me a lot. I mean, um, obviously I was at West Point, so like I kind of like have a door in, like a foot in the door with a lot of the college current college strength coaches right now. Like, um, I'm trying to get to talk to Scott Sinclair hopefully in the next two weeks. Um, because my assistant strength coach is one of his assistants now. Um, my old strength coach, one of them still at Army. The head before him is at UNC as the head strength coach. 
And then the one before him, Tim Karen, owns a gym in uh, California. Um, another one of the assistants is working for AA at USC. So, like, I've talked to a lot of them, and, like, they, they told me, you know, like, yeah. And then Coach Karen, who now owns a private gym, was like, I had to get out the college game because it was terrible. They weren't letting he him said, do He said he the college to. game is too political when it comes. Like, those are the cons of, of being as a college strength coach is that the politics behind that is, like, like, your job is predicated on how well the football coach does. Unless you get the – if you're the head strength football coach, your job is predicated on whether the head football coach is doing well or not. If he goes, chances are you're going. The only time you really have like some job security is if you're the head coach, strength coach of the whole program. And you're cool with all the coaches and the dean or president because the thing you're is- You're better off being the associate athletic director. Like if you can get associate, uh, associate, associate AD as well as being the head strength coach of the program, you're probably locked in at that point. Oh. Because then the administration cool. likes you. Yeah. Damn. And, and that's the thing is that at a certain point and a certain level, it becomes about two things, money and politics. Facts. Am I, uh, am I getting paid enough to take care of what I need to take care of? And that's the thing. A lot of these coaches in these collegiate spaces, they're tenured in. So even if yeah. you want to get, get them out, they're not yeah. getting out until they die or they're just. Now, like, unless you're Chris Doyle, who's stupid enough to get caught on uh, racist allegations, who is making one point two million dollars a year. If you're that stupid, then you're fucked. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he'll. Unfortunately, he'll be fine. He won't, bitch. He'll probably still. Oh, I don't know if Iowa. I don't know if Iowa will. Not at Iowa, just in general. Not. Oh, in general, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he'll be fine. He's but... the highest paid coach. He's the highest paid coach. He's good. He got he got a lot saved up. He should be doing some soul searching and figure out what the fuck his his mission is as a human. That's we're gonna see we're gonna see how that looks like. And probably seclude himself on the midwest of Wisconsin. So with that gun right by his lap, like I'm gonna stay right here. Fuck right in a rocking chair. <laughs> on a <leak>. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, but that's those are kind of like the three things, like when we talk about where the industry is going, those are like the three things that I, I personally see. In, and I've been in the field for three years now. Um, that's where I see the industry going. I'm still learning a lot every day, um, but that's definitely where I see things. Keep that, that uh, quote unquote white belt mentality. I still wear that white belt proud as a student of everything that I do and that will take you far to so many rooms, to so many spaces, because people know you're showing up to be of value, to learn, and to help with whatever's happening in the environment. So trust yeah. that will, your life will, is probably already at a point that it feels like it's surreal and it's magic. Keep on listening to that gut and that intuition. And we yeah. definitely got to talk about some things that, uh, that I got moving with Vela and all your connections. We can definitely make some moves. Yeah. Power, moves. Power moves. So... Moving forward, I want to talk about something that two questions. One question is when you look back at your life, you, you can easily come up with one moment where you went from an old mindset to a new mindset and it improved your quality of life. What do you think that which one stands out the most to you right now? It does not have to be fitness related, it could be about anything. Um, wow. Uh, a humbling experience, I would say, is my time in the Army. Um, so I went to West Point. Uh, I graduated high school in 2014, went to West Point from 15 to 19, and found out that I wasn't going to be a commissioned officer. Um, when did you take that? Uh, I took classes and whatnot, and I didn't find out until May – like a week before I was supposed to graduate because of medical and other reasons, right? And that's a humbling experience because um, you invested five years of your time and at that point you're like, I just wasted it. But the reason I say it's humbling and it changes the way your mindset is, is that nothing is a waste, it's just a lesson. Um, and you learn every second, every minute, every hour, um, every day. 
uh, moving forward with everything good, bad, or indifferent. Um, and if it wasn't for that humbling experience, I probably would not be here talking to you right now. Like I was a student assistant coach under Connor Hughes for two years um, before I started working at Varsity House back in September of last year. Um, so the quick transition from going from a student assistant at college to now being a sports performance coach here was kind of fast. Um, it probably doesn't happen in regular places. How but you it's, it's you. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. But it has helped me um, change the way I view situations as a whole, good, bad, or indifferent. So one thing that you definitely know from just sports, you got to pivot, you got to make moves fast. So that edge is great to have. When you can also a friend of mine, I was talking to her yesterday and she's a psychologist. She was breaking down how when we um, are dealing with a, some type of activity that becomes traumatic, cortisol is, is released, right? Oh, yeah. So when cortisol is released, this, this blew my mind. It, it kind of like sets up a fog so that that situation does not get embedded into our long term memory. Right. So the thing is, is that you're not able to work through it because you're kind of blocking that trauma unless you're mindful and present enough to figure out the lesson within that situation. Interesting. I was like, that can that makes a lot of sense because you have people that can either, will either avoid what's going on. Right. Um, shut down or face it and take it for what it is and learn from it. So you're in that space where you learn from it subconsciously. I mean, there was some consciousness to that. So oh, yeah. We're able to oh, yeah. realize those situations at the given moment. Then we can make uh, the best move possible to move forward with whatever it is that we want to do. So, Absolutely. wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's a humbling experience. But I'm here now, and, and I've, I've probably influenced more people in the nine months that I probably have in the four years I was in high school. So. There's a lot more to do, so you're, you're oh, yeah. doing the work. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> now, I'll wrap this up with my last question. What is the, a gem you would like to share to the next generation, for the next generation? Yo, don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call somebody, right? Call whoever you want to, to connect with. If you see something on Instagram, if you see something on Twitter, like, yeah, email is one thing, but like half these people don't look at their emails. My email box is up to like 600 right now. Like and my brother, <laughs> don't bother, right? Just find a way to call them, make the connections. Don't be transactional. I think one book that every human being should read is Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Um, it's a great book with action with, with actionable steps that teach you how to talk to um, just people in general and how to deal with situations. Um, now I'm not saying now everybody's not a leader, right? I, everybody you have to like you have to understand who you are. But if you want something, you have to go get it, right? In this field, if you and want everything. to be in this field, you have to go get it, right? You have to go call somebody because I'm going to be one of those cliche old head meet head coaches. It's not about your, how smart you are. It's about who you know when it comes to getting half of these jobs, right? So you're not going to know anybody if you keep yourself mute the whole time. So that's, that's probably my biggest thing is just reach out, reach out to whoever you want to and just connect with them. I love it. Great words, wise words. Juwan, thank you for your time, my brother. Juju. No problem.